Hello, I'm Professor Adam Thompson, and this is a lecture on 12-lead electrocardiography. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about the first part of STE mimics. And STE mimics are anything that can mimic an ST-elevated myocardial infarction. And when you're using the six-step method for 12-lead EKG interpretation, first learned, again, by uh, Tom Boothalay of EMS12lead.com, uh, you're going to I first identify the rate and the rhythm we've talked about in other lecture videos. Uh, the, do your axis determination and identify if there's any axis deviations, any pathologies associated with those, as we talked about in the axis tutorial. Uh, identify your intervals and your changes in morphologies. And then step five, where we are at right now, uh, you're going to look for any STE mimics. And once again, uh, you need to know what a STEMI is to understand what a STE mimic is. So a STEMI is an ST-elevated myocardial infarction. It's how we diagnose, and I put that in quotation marks because it's maybe not truly a diagnosis, uh, someone with an acute myocardial infarction in the pre-hospital environment, um, sometimes in the emergency department. This is your first diagnostic criteria. Uh, and you may activate uh, the cath lab by way of calling maybe a STEMI alert, a cardiac alert, uh, depending on where you are, uh, code save a heart in some places. And this will get the cath team activated. Um, it will also, uh, you know, initiate the troponins and the cardiac enzyme tests, so on and so forth. So to understand what an ST elevated myocardial infarction is, you need to know what uh, ST elevation is. And when we say ST, we're talking about the ST segment. And whenever you hear the word segment, uh, as, as it pertains to electrocardiography, we're talking about something that should be pretty flat, right? It doesn't include waves. So the PR segment is from the end of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex and does not include either the P wave or the QRS complex. It's a, it's a straight segment. And the ST segment is from the end of the QRS complex to the beginning of the T wave. And truly, you have a J point right here. And that's the area that we're looking right after the J point is where we're looking for ST segment elevation. And ST segment elevation is simply anything that is above the isoelectric line or the baseline. So now that you know what a STEMI is, an STE mimic is any cause of ST elevation or an acute myocardial infarction-like pattern that is not associated with an actual myocardial infarction. So there are things that can cause changes on a 12 lead EKG that may look like an acute myocardial infarction, but are in fact not. It doesn't mean that those changes are not pathological, and it doesn't mean that those changes are not lethal. However, they are not associated with occlusion of the coronary artery. The most common cause of ST elevation is not an MI. I'll say that again. The most common cause of ST elevation is not a myocardial infarction. And why is that important to remember? Well, in the pre-hospital environment, it's important to remember because we don't want to create that provider fatigue uh, uh, or sense of complacency by calling STEMI alert uh, frequently when it's not a true STEMI. You want those providers on that cath team and in the emergency department to know when you call STEMI alert that there's a great chance that this patient is experiencing an acute myocardial infarction. In fact, you want it to be that it's, it's a very close to you know certain chance because you can get close to certainty in your diagnostic skills when it comes to 12 e, uh, EKG interpretation. You will get out of it as much as you put in. You have to uh, you know, truly become an expert in this craft of EKG interpretation to have a co you know comprehensive appreciation for everything you can do with it. Less than 50% of STEMI alerts called by paramedics are actually ACS patients, and that's kind of uh, you know a generalized statement, and uh, it's hard to prove that that's true. But that's based on a single study that they did uh, over a large number of providers in a, in a few different EMS agencies. So when you're trying to identify ST segment elevation, you need to have a baseline. 
which is the isoelectric line, right? And a common mistake that providers make is they'll use the PR segment as their baseline to compare the J point to. The problem with that is the PR segment is often not on the isoelectric line. In fact, frequently the PR segment will be depressed, which will cause a pseudo, uh, if you will, ST elevation. So what I prescribe is to use the TP segment from the end of the T wave to the beginning of the P wave. If the rate is not too fast, you should be able to identify this TP segment. That should be what you use as your isoelectric line, and then compare the J point to that. So if you're able to draw a straight line from the preceding J point, and it matches up, then there's no ST elevation. Um, if you if you draw a straight line, and obviously the ST segment or the J point is elevated above that, uh, above the TP segment, then you do in fact have ST elevation. And these arrows here, off to the right, are simply pointing to where the J point is. And the J point is the change of direction from the QRS complex into the SD segment. And often you're looking for just after that, maybe one small box after that J point. That's the area you're looking at. Because I've kind of exaggerated here uh, the length of the ST segment, where often it's not that obvious where the ST segment is. It becomes more diffuse. So if you can identify where the J point is, especially if you can identify the J point in the QRS complex above or below the lead that you're looking at, then you can draw a straight line, and it should be in the same place uh, on all three leads above and below, right? Um, so if you're able to identify where the J point is, then, then right after that J point is actually the area we're looking for to be, see if it's uh, elevated or depressed. There's different morphologies in S of ST elevation, and it's not always you know, a flat line like I was just showing you before. Sometimes you have a more concave or convex presentation. And concave is if you take, a, you know, draw a straight line with a pencil from the J point to the top of the T wave, and the ST segment is below that, that would be a concave ST elevation, okay? If you're not able to, so if it's, you know, flat, like it is over here, it's more convex, flatter convex, that's pretty bad, okay? So concave, all of your ST EE -E mimics, okay, um, and all of your benign forms of ST elevation are concave, and that means it's usually not bad. However, some myocardial infarctions will present with concave ST elevation, so that's why you have to use the word usually, because it's not always. But whenever you see a flat or convex like ST elevation, this convex sometimes is called tombstones because you can literally write RIP there, okay, and draw some grass, and that's your tombstone. Um, now, that's a little bit morbid, but that's how people remember it. Uh, that type of ST, ST elevation is, is always pathological and more pathognomic of a myocardial infarction. As I said before, there are several different causes of ST elevation, most of which are not a myocardial infarction. Um, so this mnemonic is, helps a lot of people to memorize the different causes of, of ST elevation. So it spells out the word elevation, of course, so that kind of fits. You know, use a different color, elevation. It fits the, the topic, of course. And E stands for electrolytes, so hyperkalemia can certainly cause ST elevation. Uh, L for left bundle branch block. A left bundle branch block will cause ST elevation due to appropriate T-wave discordance, which you're going to learn about. Um, and it's why it was commonly taught for years that you would not try to identify a STEMI in the presence of a left bundle branch block. Early repolarization, quite possibly one of the most difficult uh, STE mimics to differentiate between uh, 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 anterior wall MI and early repolarization. V, ventricular hypertrophy for LVH. Left ventricular hypertrophy can cause what we call a strain pattern, uh, and the left ventricular strain pattern is, is pretty much what a left bundle branch block causes. Um, however, when it's narrow with those big QRSs, uh, it's LVH that's causing it, and it's uh, going to also cause ST segment elevation and depression due to your T-wave discordance rules. 
A for aneurysm. A left ventricular aneurysm is weakening of the left ventricle wall uh, after you know, a, a, an old acute anterior wall, lateral wall MI uh, that has affected that left ventricle. And then it, c- it could be weak and still present with really a chronic, consistent, uh, or persistent ST elevation pattern. T for treatment. Um, not that you'd be doing a 12 lead, but a pericardiocentesis can uh, cause ST elevation. I for injury, of course, that is an acute myocardial infarction uh, would be a, a cause for ST elevation. That's what a STEMI is. So you can also I for ischemia uh, or infarct to help you remember that. O for Osborne waves. Uh, hypothermia can cause changes on a 12 lead EKG that makes it look like the J point is elevated. Sometimes they're called J waves, these Osborne waves. Uh, they shouldn't be used to diagnose hypothermia. We have thermometers for that, but it could be uh, something that you see in the presence of hypothermia. So it's something to know about. And then N would be non-occlusive vasospasm, you know, like your Prince Metals angina patients. Whenever you're going into a lecture on STEMI, you got to talk about the contiguous leads because almost all STEMI criteria is going to include some reference to the contiguous leads. And contiguous leads just simply mean that they're leads that look at the same area of the heart. Because the vessels, uh, the coronary arteries, supply blood flow to different areas of the heart, uh, by identifying the these areas on a 12 EDKG, you can actually uh, have a pretty good uh, understanding and um, assumption of which coronary artery has occluded blood flow. So leads 1 and AVL are going to be your high lateral leads. And you'll see V5 and V6 are the same color because they are the low lateral leads. So all four of those are contiguous in a sense. 2, 3, AVF are contiguous. Those are your inferior leads. Leads 1 and V2 are contiguous. Those are septal. And then V3 and V4 are your anterior leads. In addition to that, if you had changes in V2 and V3, they could be considered contiguous. If you had changes in V4 and V5, they could be considered contiguous. Because just picture the way you're putting them on the chest. If the electrodes are close to each other in the precordial sense, so when you're putting those precordial lead electrodes on, if those electrodes are, you know, in sequence to each other, they're contiguous. You'll notice AVR is, is you know, kind of there by itself. It gets no respect, as Rodney Dangerfield would say. Uh, that's an old quote from Dr. Amo Matu. That's how he speaks about AVR. Because uh, AVR is out there in no man's land. It kind of looks at a non-specified area of the heart, and it doesn't really have contiguous leads. V1 would be the closest to the same view. So a lot of times you'll see the same morphologies in AVR and V1. You have to understand your reciprocal changes um, if you're trying to diagnose a STEMI or ST mimic. Um, I will say if you have any reciprocal changes, you need to throw STE mimic on the back burner and consider your patient to be having a STEMI until proven otherwise. Because there's not a lot of STE mimics that will show you reciprocal changes, if any. So if you see reciprocal changes, you need to be thinking this is an acute myocardial infarction. And what are reciprocal changes? Well, if you're... If you have ST elevation and, and the leads facing a certain area of the heart, the reciprocal leads may show ST depression. Okay, so it would be the opposite. All right, so the septal leads, they don't really have reciprocal leads. I guess you could call the posterior leads reciprocal to the septal leads, but V1 and V2 doesn't have true receptacle leads, and neither does V3 or V4. So you'd have to do a posterior 12 lead to really have reciprocal changes for your anterior lateral or anterior septal MIs, excuse me. And then these are probably the most important, your lateral uh, and your inferior leads when it comes to reciprocal changes. If you have changes in your inferior leads that show ST elevation, and then you look at AVL, that's the first one I look at for reciprocal changes. If you look at AVL uh, and you see ST depression, that's a STEMI. That's, that's almost definitely a inferior wall myocardial infarction. So that's how reciprocal changes work. Often, you'll have a posterior wall MI, and we say V7, V8, and V9 are facing, and you don't have those on your traditional 12 EDKG, but the first thing you'll see is reciprocal changes. You'll see ST depression, 
and maybe a tall R wave, which is a reciprocal Q wave, uh, maybe an inverted T wave, which is maybe a hyperacute T wave on the other side. Um, you'll see the reciprocal changes in the in the septal and even the anterior leads. So you'll do that uh, that posterior 12 EDKG, and you'll be able to identify a posterior uh, wall MI. So first SDE mimic we're going to talk about is left ventricular hypertrophy. LVH in itself means a enlarged hypertrophied, if you will, left ventricle, and hypertrophy is enlargement of the muscle. It's the opposite of atrophy, if you know what atrophy means. It's when the muscle gets small from lack of use. So if it's hypertrophied, it's probably been overused. So a lot of people try to picture athletes as the, the you know, person with uh, LVH or left ventricular hypertrophy, and they could have athlete's heart. However, most athletes just have high voltage. It's a normal variant in a young person. But the congestive heart failure patient uh, certainly has cardiomegaly and develops an LVH, left ventricular hypertrophy, and they're the ones w that will uh, quite honestly present with this strain pattern, which is a re repolarization abnormality associated with LVH, and it can cause ST segment changes. It often does. And STEMI is more difficult, but still possible to identify in the presence of LVH. So this strain pattern we're talking about is uh, in the left precordial leads, V4, V5, and V6, you'll have upright QRS complexes with ST depression due to what we call T-wave discordance. T-wave discordance. And all T-wave discordances is that the T-wave is going in the opposite direction as the last wave of the QRS complex or the predominant wave of the QRS complex. So here we have a positive QRS complex and the T wave is negative. And it, what it does is that T wave drags the J point with it and it can cause ST depression when it's a negative T wave. And over here in the right precordial leads, you'll have the opposite thing going on where you'll have a very deep QS wave or deep QRS and then a positive T wave which drags up this J point causing ST elevation in the right precordial leads, V1, V2, V3. Here's just another graphic kind of showing you what T wave discordance is. And there are three conditions I want you to uh, remember or even memorize that cause a T wave discordance as a normal change with their pathology. It would be left bundle branch block, right bundle branch block, and LVH. Okay, so your bundle branch blocks, when you have a positive terminal wave, you have a negative T wave. So this is like a right bundle branch block in the right precordial leads, very common. And it's why, if you think about it, you still can identify STEMI in a right bundle branch block because usually you'll have ST depression. So if you have ST elevation, that's probably pretty bad. And over here, this is what you would see with a left bundle branch block in your precordial leads. And this is obviously why it's more difficult to identify STEMI in the presence of a left bundle branch block because you'll have a negative terminal wave and you can get a lot of elevation. And the elevation is going to be, um, it's going to be proportionate to the size of the QRS complex and the size of the T wave. So as the QRS complex gets bigger, as it often does with a left bundle branch block, uh, you'll get even more ST elevation. So here's a great example of uh, left ventricular strain. So I got to tell you first what LVH is, right? So if you read the textbook, uh, it'll tell you to add the tallest, uh, you know, or our deepest, excuse me, uh, S wave in either V1 or V2. Add the millimeters together. So you're going to count all those small boxes um, and add them to either the tallest R wave in V5 or V6, whichever one's tallest. So let's say we had... In V2, let's say this is, you know, 15 millimeters deep. And this R wave over here in V5, let's say it's 15 millimeters tall. You would add that together. And then some texts will tell you if it's greater than 35, that is indicative of LVH. Unfortunately, a pre-hospital uh, 12 ED EKG monitor won't often give you those numbers because, as you can see here in V3, you see how it's flat at the bottom of this QRS complex? That's because the monitor actually cuts the depth of that QRS complex off, so it doesn't interfere uh, with you know certain parts of the tracing. So you wouldn't want this lead interfering with this lead or this lead interfering with this lead. You almost have a little bit of that happening here where you have uh, the change in, in uh, negative to positive 
So you're not going to get that. So what I tell you to look for is A, high voltage. So you have high voltage here. There's not a doubt about that. You have big QRS complexes and the strain pattern. And you do have that. So if you look over here, these are your right precordial leads, V1 through V3. You have negative uh, terminal wave and a positive T wave. So we have T wave discordance. And we, have a, we do have some concave upright ST elevation. And I will say that V2, V3 are probably the most difficult if somebody was having acute myocardial infarction. Uh, it, it would probably be the most common MI to go unnoticed because th they're diffu uh, it's a diffuse uh, J point, so it's, it's kind of not sharp and easy to identify. On top of that, these two leads often have a, a normal variant of ST elevation, about one millimeter, up to almost two millimeters in a lot of people. And uh, that makes it much more difficult to identify a pathologic cause. So getting back to this left ventricular strain pattern, you have this kind of upright swooping up ST elevation uh, and that T wave discordance we talked about over here. And then in the left precordial leads where our, our QRS becomes more positive, we do get a little bit of ST depression. Okay, that's not a reciprocal change. Obviously, these two lead, you know, three leads aren't reciprocal to these three leads. Um, but what it is, is that left ventricular strain pattern. So the T wave discordance causes the the uh, J point to be dragged in the opposite direction. Here's another example, and quite possibly a more uh, pathologically appearing example. This, you know, for the avid 12 EDKG interpreter, this is going to look pretty bad initially. Um, and remember I was telling you those that textbook definition of LVH by adding the S waves and V1 or V2 to the R waves and V5 or V6? Well, there's uh, there's... Even more definitions that involve the limb leads, and this would certainly meet the criteria within those uh, definitions. But I see the strain pattern uh, in addition to seeing high voltage, so I know I'm probably dealing with LVH that, uh, in a strain pattern. So this strain pattern, again, it gives me the ST elevation where I would expect it, and it gives me a little bit of a J-point depression where I would expect that to exist. Okay, so again, you have to be able to identify this strain pattern. You even see that the strain pattern exists over here in the limb leads. And it doesn't fit an acute myocardial infarction pattern. Uh, what I mean by that is that when you have um, ST elevation and 2-3 AVF, you should have some ST depression in, v in leads 1 in, in AVL and maybe V1 and V2. When you have um, you know depression like this in, in so many leads, that could be an indication of something serious. But when it matches an STE mimic, um, it, it's usually safe to assume that that's what's going on. Here's another example, and I know I'm kind of breezing over these 12 leads and I'm not going through them in a systematic fashion. You would want to follow your six-step process uh, when interpreting any 12 EDKG, but in an effort to just teach you these patterns and showing you as many as possible, um, I'm just kind of going right to the LVH pattern. So again, we see high voltage over here in the precordial leads. We see it even in the limb leads. Um, in these right precordial leads, uh, we, we see a negative QRS complex with a little bit of ST elevation uh, that swooped up ST elevation. And then w right over here in the left precordial leads, we do see that downward sloping ST depression uh, where you have the T wave discordance. So it all fits the left ventricular strain pattern. And the only way to get good at identifying these is to look at a lot of them. Um, the more you look up online and, you know, join uh, social media, EKG clubs and groups and pages and constantly look at uh, different EKGs, the, the more these are going to stand out to you because these are uh, any avid uh, 12 EDKG interpreter would have no problem uh, immediately identifying what's going on here. So one thing that occurs with uh, the left ventricular strain pattern is it, there's kind of that uh, evolution of the T wave where it starts out pretty positive, okay, and eventually flattens out and inverts into negative as you go from V1 to V6 in a sequential fashion, okay? Um, and you may see a similar change in the ST elevation being 
uh, more and then less, less, flattens out to isoelectric and then becomes depressed. So that's it for the first lecture on STE mimics. You can go back and review other uh, course videos within the 12 EDKG course uh, or move on to the next uh, video on STE mimics. And don't forget to click and subscribe.